I'm just going to start the meeting up again as people just gradually move back in again. And we're all online, are we, Louise? Right. Um, because as Crispin said, I feel like an airport and an aeroplane conductor, we're trying to catch up. And I really don't want everybody here until after dinner, but I do want to be able to have enough time to make sure that we're hearing all these absolutely excellent talks for the rest of this session. So session four, I'm very pleased to introduce, which is a amalgam of um, themed talks, mace, mostly around pediatrics and pediatric areas, but in um, with a, a national guest speaker to start us off. So I'm going to move very quickly forward to introduce Dr. Tina Marinelli, who's I'm delighted to have uh, come up from the Royal Alfred. Who um, Tina is an infectious disease staff specialist with very great interest and expertise in infection and immunocompromised hosts and in transplant recipients. Thank you, Tina. Thanks, Julia, and thanks for the team for organising such a great day. And um, I feel really privileged to be standing up here after such an amazing array of speakers and experts in the field. So. I'm going to be speaking on increased virologic risk donors and HIV, and I think my talk ties in nicely with some of the talks that we've already had today. Um, so my disclosures, overview, so a couple of related topics that I'm trying to put together into a nice cohesive talk. I'm first going to touch on increased virologic risk donors, some of the concepts and concerns, speak about HIV and organ donation. And then uh, something that really terrifies me about solid organ transplantation, it's the unknown unknowns, it's the unexpected viral transmissions via, via allografts. So we've heard a little bit about the organ shortage. We know that in Australia in 2023, we had 513 deceased organ donors, and that resulted in the almost 1,400 recipients. And as you can see, over time, this number is increasing. But there's still a shortage. There are 191,000 people who die in Australia every year. Of that, whittles down to just 513 organ donors. We have 1,800 people on the wait list and another 14,000 people on dialysis. And we can see from UNOS data the disparity between those on the wait list and those who are actually getting transplanted is increasing over time. So how can we increase our organ availability? We can either optimise the use of available organs, and we've heard from Olivia about ex vivo perfusion. We can split the grafts in the case of liver and lungs. We can look to other species, um, for example, xenotransplantation, which is right here on our doorstep. And we can expand our donor pool either by using extended criteria donors, donation after cardiac death, living donation, or what I'm going to speak about is high, risk, high virologic risk donors and donors with chronic viral infections. Just to touch on donor-derived diseases, Two-thirds of donor-derived diseases are actually infection. It's much more common with deceased donation. They are associated with a very high mortality, particularly malignancy more so than infection, and also a high rate of graft failure. Donor-derived infections can either be expected. For example, we know that we give people CMV, EBV, Hep B, C, HIV, or unexpected. So, for example, our respiratory viruses, LCMV, and many other things. And we've got lots of mitigation strategies in place along the way. For example, pre-donation pre screening, we take lots of cultures and serologies at the time of transplant, and we give prophylaxis to our recipients. So looking at our increased virologic risk donors, and this is taken directly from the TSA and Z guidelines, and it's the intentional use of donors with certain infections that may be considered where there is acceptable risk of morbidity of the recipient, mitigated by serostatus matching or by antimicrobial prophylaxis and monitoring. So basically we're accepting these risks if we know what we're doing and we know what the risk is and we can communicate that to the recipients. We've heard about increased virologic risk donors, and these are really donors who are at increased risk of Hep C, Hep B, and HIV, and they're defined by a known increased risk behaviour, and we classically think about it as someone who dies with a needle in their arm. That's a very classic scenario. Or they have a risk behaviour that's within the NAT window for viral hepatitis or HIV, and for the purposes of organ donation, that's classified as within 22 days from admission to hospital, but to death in hospital. And um, they have no evidence of ACT in infection. Now, one of the problems with our donors and understanding who's donating, what the risks are, is we don't have good national data. It's all sort of held on a state level. 
So this is data from Karen Waller from a couple of years ago. She looked at um, two, just over 2,000 organ donors in New South Wales over a 15-year period. 72 had a viral infection, and from these there were 173 recipients. Of those, 24 of the recipients had the same infection as the donor. 149 were thus at risk of viral transmission. In that, there were only three cases of acute donor-derived infection. Two were hep B, one was hep C, and there were 16 potential late transmissions. And these really went out to five years post-transplant. So it's difficult at that stage to attribute it to the donor. And more importantly, none of those cases were surprised. They knew about the viral risk in that donor. So our current process for organ donation screening is very safe. Looking at um, the current status of bloodborne virus or increased risk donors in New South Wales, over an eight, uh, 18 year, sorry, eight year period, there were just under 6,000 potential organ donors of which 624 perceived have an increased risk for bloodborne viruses. 5% of those um, with hep C and 82 were declined for donation. Um, four percent were at increased had increased bloodborne virus risk behaviours, and thirty eight of those donors were declined for donation. So that's one hundred and ten organs that were not used, one hundred and ten donors that were not used. When donors with increased risk are used, we know that they donate fewer organs because they're less accepted. But those donors tend to be younger and have far fewer comorbidities. And we heard earlier that they tend to have better organ, better quality organs. So it's a really, it's an untapped resource and there's potential underutilization because our perceived risk of um, increased risk of bloodborne viruses. So I guess that's setting the scene. And we've already heard about how we're using donors with, from, with active hepatitis C infection, the success we've had from that program. And I suppose one thing that, well, the one virus that we've all been afraid of over the years is HIV. Looking at the history of HIV and solid organ transplant, prior to 1996, HIV positive recipients had a far worse outcome than HIV negative recipients. Survival rates have really increased with the rapid availability of antiretroviral therapy. And in the post ART era, the transplant outcomes are almost equivalent for the recipients. When we're looking at the use of HIV positive donors, so the, in the late 80s, when HIV was sort of all taking off, there was an act put in place that it was illegal to use organs from someone who was known to be HIV positive. That act wasn't revoked until 2013 and the Obama government and the HOPE Act came into, came into play. Prior to that, um, we'd seen the first HIV negative to HIV positive transplant in um, South Af in sorry in the US, which was done in the early two thousands, and then we saw the first HIV positive to HIV positive kidney transplant, which was done in South Africa. And as you'll see, a lot of these transplants have been done in South Africa because obviously that's where the epidemiology and greater risk of HIV is. The first living donor for um, a HIV positive living donor was done in South Africa also in 2017. And that was the first time we saw a HIV positive to a HIV negative donation. And that was a mother donating to her infant child. So just quickly going back through the HIV negative to positive, as I mentioned, there were worse outcomes seen in the initial studies for this. When you break it down, a lot of it was due to HCV co-infection. And if you look at the time that the studies were done, it's before they had antivirals or easily administrable antivirals for hepatitis C. We need to work up both the donors and the recipients carefully. For the donor, things that we're worried about are, does the donor have resistance mutations? What's their current status of their HIV, their CD4 count that's determining their risk of opportunistic infections and latent infections? What co-infections do they have? And has there been damage to the or end organ damage to the organ that's potentially going to be transplanted? In the recipient, we generally want a CD4 count greater than 200. We want them to be suppressed on a stable ART regimen. They can't have active opportunistic infections or ones that can't be treated in the pre peritransplant period. Um, and we know that the end organ damage from HIV may actually be the indication for transplant. So the concern that we've had that hasn't been answered for some time is, is there a trans increased transmission risk for opportunistic infections? And can you have HIV super infection and a transient loss of viral suppression when you transplant to HIV positive to positive organs? So the first study to come out was from South Africa. Um, Elmi Mueller, who's a kidney transplant surgeon, has really pioneered this field. So they looked at their kidney transplants 
um, they excluded um, anyone who really had end-stage HIV active infections, tuberculosis, those who had no history of receiving antiretroviral therapy, or so they had to have no history or be on antiretroviral therapy with a basically a suppressed viral load. Um, their recipients had standard opportunistic infection prophylaxis. In this study, they had 15 donors and 27 recipients. Um, and although they didn't have a comparison group, they, for what their transplant outcomes were in South Africa during this time period, it's fairly comparable. And so we didn't see any significant um, risk of the grafts not surviving or and the patients dying. And more importantly, in these patients, there was no loss of virologic suppression or significant decrease in their CD4 count post-transplant. Once the HOPE protocol came into play, they set some very, this is all done under a research act. So a research protocol, very clear um, guidelines about who can be transplanted. And the first two studies came out with their kidney and their liver recipients. So the studies are a little bit funny that they had 75 HIV positive recipients, uh, sorry, recipients um, from HIV positive donors, but actually a lot of their donors were HIV negative. And that was because they included the donors that had a false positive HIV test. But nonetheless, they had enrolled them into the trial and they used them as a control group. So that's obviously too small to see, but you can see from their survival that the only um, the only places where there was significant difference between the two groups, there was a very, very slight uh, significantly dif a significance in the overall survival favoring the HIV negative donors. And again, in the cancer-free survival, it favored the HIV negative donors also. And again, no breakthrough HIV uremia attributed to the donor. Very, very similar study done in the liver transplant, so I won't go into too much through in too much detail. And the similar things were seen in terms of slight reduction in survival and a slight reduction in cancer-free survival. So I think HIV positive to positive transplants are certainly happening in the States. It's still happening under a, trans a research protocol. It isn't mainstream yet. In Australia, we have done one HIV positive to positive transplant. That was a kidney transplant recipient at RPA who's doing well about a year post um, transplant. I think we have a much less uh, pool of both HIV positive donors and recipients. But even in the States where they developed the HOPE Act and the HOPE trial with the deluge, they thought there was going to be a massive deluge of IV drug users and lots of lots of people dying with HIV, but they really haven't recruited as quickly as they thought they would, which is good, I guess. Um, we look a lot at living donors to try and increase our donor pool. Um, so there are some concerns, particularly with using HIV positive living donors, mainly for the donor themselves. For kidneys, there's a theoretical increased risk of HIV associated kidney disease, even if it's not present pre-donation. Um, and uh, urologically suppressed on heart. And uh, as I noted, the first living kidney donor kidney transplant was performed in the USA in 2019. In terms of liver, considering when you donate a liver, you basically donate half of your liver, it's really unclear whether HIV infection pose an, poses an additional risk to the donor. And so I think it would only be done under very specific circumstances, like the case I mentioned where the mother donated to the child. So does donor-derived HIV superinfection occur? So both the South Africans and the US, have, US studies looked at this. So in the South African study, they looked at donor-recipient pairs, 26 recipients. 11 of the 15 donors had a detectable viral load at transplant, but all of the recipients were virologically suppressed following transplant. They collected serial samples of plasma and PBMCs. They did reverse trans transcriptase gene and viral envelope sequencing. And they found that there were drug-resistant mutations developed in six recipients, but none of them were donor-derived. The donor virus was detectable in eight recipients in the very early post-transplant period, but not later. And there was one case of possible superinfection with a viral sequence that was 98% similar in the donor and recipient. In the US study, they looked at um, donor-recipient pairs, eight liver and 14 kidneys. Again, they serially sampled up to three years post-transplant. Um, they looked at HIV proviral DNA and viral DNA from the viremic time point sequences and used a site-directed next-generation sequencing assay for the reverse transcript transcriptase and GP41 genes. They had the problem they weren't able to obtain adequate viral, adequate viral sequences from many of their um, uh, many of their recipients. 
But in those that they did, there was no evidence of donor-derived HIV superinfection. There was one viremic episode, and that was in a recipient who stopped taking the ART, so not surprising. And there was no donor virus in that, um, in the virus that was detected. So moving on, just to sort of lighten the mood a little bit, or not really lighten the mood, it's a pretty morbid topic, but it's an incredibly interesting topic and something that really keeps me on my toes every day is the unexpected viral transmission in solid organ transplantation. And I always tell my trainees, whenever we walk into the room, particularly in the first year post-transplant and certainly in the first three months post-transplant, there is another patient in the room and that's the donor and you need to consider that at all times, otherwise you will miss things. So this is a case, this is a series of cases that um, you may have read about. So there were four recipients who had rapid neurologic deterioration, agitation, delirium, seizures in all four recipients of the same donor. And thankfully, three of those recipients were at the same hospital. So you had the same clinicians who were recognizing this unusual syndrome in three of their recipients. Um, as you can see, and something that also terrifies me is patient one only had an iliac artery transplanted. The reason this terrifies me is because sometimes we don't realize that a patient has had a liver, for example, from one donor, and they've actually had an artery or another, um, uh, well, it's usually the arteries or veins that come from another donor. So you've actually got a fourth um, patient in the room to consider, and that's not always reflected very well in our communications. So the iliac artery, the liver, the kidney, and two kidneys, um, all who progressed through this neurologic deterioration and ended up dying. They then went back to the donor. The donor had presented with difficulty swallowing, nausea and vomiting, and had a subarachnoid hemorrhage and died within four days of presentation. They then went to the donor's friends and found out that the donor had been bitten by a rat, a bat, sorry, in recent times. And this is a case of donor-derived rabies that was transplant transmitted to all four recipients and was um, fatal in all four of them. Again, highlighting the need for very, very thorough donor histories and the complexities of it. We wouldn't normally go to someone's friends to get history for this type of thing. Um, this was a really interesting case. So again, there were four recipients, kidney, heart, liver, and another kidney, um, who all presented with varying degrees of fever, fatigue, malaise, um, progressive neurologic decline, meningoencephalitis, um, two died, one at seven months post this illness, one at 56 days, and the last two had near, near, near complete recovery uh, over a year post transplant. So when they were going back, they did a trace back for the donor. The donor. They found out the donor had a traumatic brain injury on day minus nine prior to donation, and they had a blood transfusion on day three. By this stage, they started testing for unusual things and found that the recipients had tested positive for yellow fever, as had the donor. The donor had no history of travel to a yellow fever endemic area. So they then went back and did a, um, a contact trace on the blood transfusions. It turns out the donor had received a blood donation from a person who donated bloods um, five days after receiving a yellow fever vaccination that wasn't declared on their donation. So that sort of sequence of events had resulted in the death of two patients. So something a little bit closer to home, HHV8. So I have a question about whether it's an increasing risk or it's increasingly recognised. We generally think of HHV8 as having a lower seroprevalence in Australia. We know from old studies that 5.8% of our blood donors are HHV8 seropositive, and that increases to 18% in higher risk populations like MSM. We know that donors who have increased with behavioural risk factors for other bloodborne viruses may pose a higher risk of transmitting HHV8. It's a really, really complex thing to diagnose in recipients. I'm not sure if anyone else has had much experience with this because HHV8 related diseases are they're very varied from the classic Kaposi sarcoma to your Kaposi sarcoma immune cytokine release syndrome, your um, primary fusion lymphoma, multiceptric Castleman's disease, HLH, and they kind of fall into the spectrum of inflammatory, lymphoproliferative, and malignancy. We see the worst outcomes of donor derived HHV8 in liver transplant. So, at RPA in the last, since 2017, we've had four cases that we've suspected to be donor derived, two were possible. And two out of four of those patients have 
have died. The two that had a better survival were those with Kaposi's sarcoma. And I guess the more concerning thing is we don't we don't currently screen for HHV in Australia. We don't have a serology test available, and the utility of using a PCR screening on donors and recipients is really unclear how we use that. Um, it's very established in parts of Italy where they do do HHV-8 screening routinely at some centres. Um, and then what they do with that result is they use it to modify their immunosuppression early. And in some cases, they give rituximab. There's been an increased number of HHV-8 cases in transplant recipients in the UK. And they, just within the last 12 months, have in implemented a universal screening program. So I guess it's something for us to keep on the back of our minds, particularly uh, either as a donor drive disease or as reactivation. So I guess luckily, although the outcomes from donor-derived infections and particularly donor-derived viral infections can be quite significant, they do remain rare. Unexpected donor-derived disease is only, only occurs in 0.18% of all transplant recipients, but results in death or graft loss in 33% of those. This is a paper from um, uh, the US looking at UNOS data at unexpected transmission of viruses. And as you can see, there's not a lot, despite the huge number of, um, of transplants that occur in the US. The thing to say, as I mentioned, that within the first three months is really the greatest time. Donor-derived viral infections generally present within 48 days, but they can be delayed out to over a year. So we just need to think about them. So for me, you can tell that I'm a mum of boys. We're talking about the spidey senses. What sets the spidey senses going for donor-derived viral infection? So I Think about it particularly when I've got a recipient who's early post-transplant, when we know that there's more than one recipient infected, when it affects the transplanted organ, you start to start to think about what it might what might be going on. When it's a really unusual presentation and you just cannot put your finger on what is going on, and particularly when either the uh, when the recipient has encephalitis. In terms of the donor, these are the recipients that I always go back to the donor sheets and go through them with a fine tooth comb. Were there any risk factors for exposure, travel, animal exposure, vaccinations? I've even been Googling pig farms in southwest New South Wales and looking at the incidence of Japanese encephalitis at times. Um, and then we always look at the factors surrounding death. Did they have encephalitis? Were they given high-dose steroids in intensive care prior to donation? Have they reactivated something in that peri-transplant period? On that note, I'll finish there.